Hello and welcome to our first of J March <laughs> 2021 and we've called this evening's our jam event March of the robots. We are in March and we have some robots that we've brought with us and we have some humans as well who have come to join us this evening for this evening's jam. Now, we do have a number of talks. I think we've got eight, if I count correctly, lined up. And um, we will be telling you, I could read through them very quickly. So we'll start in a moment with Erin, who's going to be telling us about her robot hand that she shared recently online. And we have Kerry, who's going to be talking to us about Dundee bots. Stuart Shum, who created a robot cocktail mixer. Uh, Brian, who can control his Raspberry Pi robot over the web or a local area network. We then have Alessandro, who will be discussing autonomous driving Raspberry Pi robot. Um, and that's not that easy to say. <laughs> and then Gary has, is going to crawl along. That means he will have a compact robot automator with legs. And then Paul will be joining us about five past eight. He's going to explain about how he's been designing better bots. And then we've been saving up the big uh, presentation at the end. There's this huge epic event that has, that has taken place over many years called Pi Wars. And one of the founders of Pi Wars, Mike Horn, is going to be joining us at the end to sh share with us a little bit about the competition, the conference and the inspiration. Now, a couple of things before we start. So... You should be watching this live on YouTube or the recording. And to talk about recordings, we've been recording all of our jams since we started doing these live online about a year ago. And you can go and watch those later on if you want. Um, I do have, it's a confession time, apology time. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background. And sometimes when you're doing a lot of this stuff in the background, sometimes things get overlooked. And I was going to say we make mistakes, but actually it was me. I made a big boo-boo last month and we had all of our presenters lined up ready to speak we tested everybody and somehow I completely overlooked one detail one speaker Stephen Amor and poor Stephen was he didn't want to interrupt me to say Alan you forgot about me and oh my gosh so please if you see us make a mistake or do something wrong then let us know you know if you want to start with a quiet whisper and we're not listening then please let us know we're trying to make this a rich warm welcoming community that people can come along to yes we make mistakes and sometimes it's fun but I don't think it was very fun for Stephen so really strong apologies to Stephen for doing that last month we have some themes coming up up for the next few months so in april we we have a gardening theme for april so maybe you've seen something heard something you've read about something or you've started working on something who says it has to be related to technology i mean people generally do have their projects related to technology but we're asking how does your garden grow and maybe you've got some kind of monitoring system or some way of forecasting how how bountiful your tomatoes are going to be or or whether you're trying to split seeds. I don't know. So please come along in April and find out what people have been doing. And we'd love you to come and share something with us. And I'm now going to announce the themes for the next couple of months after that. So in May, well, crazy idea. We're going to call it Brian May. So <laughs> if you've got an idea for something related to rock music guitar, other instruments that involve pluck strings or just music or queen or the queen, then bring it along for our Brian May themed event. And then somebody made an announcement not so long ago that in June, some restrictions will be removed and maybe think people are thinking about traveling places in June. So I wondered if June should be a month where we're thinking about taking our tech on tour. I've got all my tech around me. And if I was to go off and travel somewhere, what would I take with me and why? So get, get started thinking about your ideas for projects or things to talk about related to taking tech on tour for June. In Now, I've given a little bit more information than I need to at this point. Our first presenter, who is about to start to talk about it now, they're going to switch on their camera and unmute. And I can mute my video for now. So Erin, let's hear it. Hello. 
Sorry, I'm terrible at doing stuff like this. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, okay, hang on. Let's just do this properly. Here we go. We can edit all these bits out. Right, that looks fab. Okay, Erin, over to you. Hello, Alan. Hello, hello everybody. It's me, Erin. Would you like to turn your camera on or, or not? It's up to you. Camera on or camera off? I think she's just going to go through a presentation. Then. Oh, okay. That's fine. That's okay. okay. It's me, Erin. I hope you're all well and I hope you like this presentation. Bionic hands. Bionics? are very useful in daily life. Say, if someone got their arm amputated, this would be very useful for a replacement arm. Example of bionics are replacement limbs, like arms, legs, hands, insulin pumps for people with diabetes. The insulin pump will automatically control the person's blood sugar level. Pacemaker. This makes the heartbeat steadily and regularly. You, can, you can't, you can, you can even get bionic eyes and eardrums. How I first made my bionic hand. There are some great instructions available to help you make your own bionic hand online. All you need is string, card, a skewer, straws, and sellotape. I made my first bionic hand at, at a guide meeting last week. It was really fun to do. We followed some simple step-by-step -step instructions. Using straws where, you, where the joints are, and I had to use a skewer to thread through to thread the string through the straws. That was tricky. If you're going to make your own bionic hand, remember to stick the tape over the tips of, of the fingers to make it stronger. Thank you for watching. Any questions? So Erin, why on earth did you decide to make a robot hand and like not a robotic head or foot or Robotic thumb. Why a hand? Uh, probably because I just thought, um, yeah, hands are cool and it's going to be pretty cool to do this. So. Sometimes people say it would be useful to have an extra hand, you know? So, and did you go for, is it a right hand or a left hand that we've gone for? That's well, your left hand, yeah? So it's, it's your left hand. And after building it, if I've noticed sometimes you build something the first time and it, it, it's pretty good, but then the second time and maybe even a third time, if you were to build another one, do you think you might do things a little bit differently if you were to uh, hold it up so we can see it? Because there's two sides to it. There's the side where we can see all of the mechanism and if you flip it over, we can see. It so reminds me a little bit of Barney the dinosaur. Have you ever seen his hands? Yeah. <laughs> so if you were doing this again, would you do exactly the same thing, the same materials? Or you think, oh, well. No. No. <laughs> oh. So I would um, change the tape to a stronger tape. I would... Um, Change, change the the straws to make them a bit stronger, and I'd use um the sh like I'd do the string the same, but instead of just one string on all of them, I'd put two on all of them. And I'm wondering, the material that you made the hand out of it looks like a thin card, and I was wondering yeah, if, you'd, if you'd made a thicker, if you'd chosen a thicker card, say like like. There's, don't say I told you to do this, but there's a big, thick cardboard box, like the kind of ones that people use when they're moving home. If you'd used card like that, corrugated card, which has got all these flutes and ribs in it, and it, do you think that might have been a better material to use? No. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. So we can leave those boxes where they are. We don't need to cut them up. But it, I just wonder if, 
because you've got your hand is kind of floppy and if you'd gone for a, a more rigid material whether that might have been a, a good idea so well, but if it's if it's rigid yeah it'd be it'd be harder for like to pull it so it like like this one because it's flexible mm -hmm. you bend it and it's completely fine it doesn't break because the card is very light so it can um so the string they like because when like if i made one out of yeah like really thick cardboard and i just had this string which is very thin and all i did like if i just pulled it but it only went up to there when i pulled it as tight as i can when it, like if it was there it only went up to there i would have to pull it even more and sure. then it most likely break so, so the other thing that was, it was making me think of is sometimes, you know, when you live in a house that has gardens with other gardens next door and sometimes things go over the fence, like, I don't know, maybe somebody dropped a parcel and it was over a fence and you couldn't reach it, whether there was a way of attaching it to some longer object like a tube and you could, like, because you, obviously you can pull string and you could attach string and you could have, you know, this sort of, oh, somebody's dropped a parcel and it's in a place I'm not supposed to go, but maybe what I could do is I could pull a string and oh, I've got the parcel. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's an idea for another thing. So Erin, it would be great if we could persuade you to come back in April for something to do with growing or May, something to do with rock music or rocks or the queen. So think about that, or maybe even thinking about traveling and taking tech on tour. So, I've already got loads of ideas. Um, brilliant. Don't, don't, don't stay them now because other people might steal your ideas. So, Erin, thank you very much for joining us. And we might see you over on the live stream now. Now, what we need to do is we talked about taking things on tour. We're going to travel a bit further north now. We're going to head up to a few hundred miles north up to Dundee, where Kerry is going to be joining us this evening. Are you there, Kerry? Can you hear? Do I have to shout? No, you're fine. Oh, you can hear me nice and clearly in Dundee. Oh, oh it's, yes. It's, it's very dark up there. It will go dark a bit earlier up in Dundee. Yeah, just and a little you're, bit. You're going to be talking to us about Dundee bots. And you're, I know you're on Twitter at Raspi Kid, So people could yes. look at you on Twitter now if they, if they chose. And you've got it on there. OK, Kerry, over to you. No problem. We'll make sure it all works. That show up okay, Alan? Sorry, unmuted myself. Yeah, we can see your <laughs> slides like, looking lovely. Perfect. So, yes, Dundee Bots is a new project that I have started that's fully funded by the Institute of Engineering and Technology and IMEC, so the Institution of Mechanical Engineering, to teach kids through Dundee schools on how to code robotic robots and also where going to design a kit, kit to actually take into the schools and teach the teachers and things and how to use them as well. Um, as well as obviously offering teacher support um, to use the kit as well as with other coding and meetups and things as well because part of the stuff that the uh, Stuff that IET want to know about is how local educators and professionals are working together. Um, so we thought of creating a meetup where everyone could come along and introduce themselves and work together, and hopefully, the professionals can maybe teach the education, edu the teachers and educators something along the way. Um, so as I say, we're just getting started with this project, so we don't have much to show yet, um, but we are available at. Um, info at Dundee Bots if you want to get in touch and there's also a website and Twitter under the hashtag Dundee Bots as we couldn't be bothered having another Twitter account to monitor. <laughs> Kerry, you're involved in quite a few different... You could say that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Clubs and projects and community. I, yeah, I seem to get um, conned into a lot, but no, this one is fully funded. So at least I get paid for doing this one. 
it's just the reason I'm saying this for people who haven't watched some of our previous talks. Um, we've yeah. record, we've released recently the recording of our jam from April last year when you and Josh came along and you spoke about the Microbit magazine, which yes. is something yeah. you were heavily involved with at the time. And you've come back many times to talk about lots of different things. And, and I do struggle to see how you find the time to fit all these things in. <laughs> At the minute, so do I. Um, yeah, it's it is great. Uh, I mean, yeah, I work only part time at the minute and doing this the rest rest of the time. So, um, but the education science seems to be growing more and more. But the other thing I can't help noticing is there seems to be an awful lot of tech stuff going on in and around Dundee. Is that just? I mean, people say that's about Preston, of course, but is, do you think that's true? Is there a, like a tech scene, which say digital creativity around Dundee? Yeah, you could say that, considering it's known sort of as the game development capital of the UK. So, um, yeah, there's loads of games companies. Um, it's where Lemmings was made, um, and also the first GTA as well. And Rockstar recently just moved back into Dundee. And this isn't there, is it the University of Aberté or is, yes? Is, yeah. Okay. Oh, and the v &A as well, that's that other... Oh, yes, thing. yeah. But Dun Dundee sounds like a really, really interesting place to go and visit, yeah? There is a lot of stuff going on in Dundee, considering, yeah, it never used to have that, a great reputation, but there are long waterfront and stuff now, there's amazing stuff going on. Okay, and I'm just looking at all your logos and everything behind you, so you've got Microbit, you've got Raspberry Pi, <laughs> you've got the, the Micro Mag magazine. So for people who don't know, can you just give us a quick sort of summary of... What is Micromag? Uh, where can people get hold of it? Why would they want to use it? What's it all about and how much it costs? So Micromag is a news website all about the BBC Microbit um, that Josh and I created nearly four years ago now, which is kind of unbelievable. <laughs> um, we did sell physical copies, but we decided it was a better use of our time putting it all online and it is absolutely free for anyone to access. And we've had a question from somebody on YouTube. Ooh. So this is Michael who will be speaking later on. And Michael's asking, are there plans to make the magazine, you know, to expand it, to make it more compatible with, with Pi, Arduino, Microbits? Now, I don't know, actually, Michael might have been talking about the Dundee bots or he may be talking about the magazine. So we could try that question twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, the Dundee, Dundee Bots kit, the kit for yeah. the Dundee Bots. Yeah. So the kit for Dundee Bots, um, we want to make as accessible as possible. So teaching from primary school right the way through to the end of secondary. So we do plan on trying to make it with Microbit. Uh, Raspberry Pi, Pico probably, as they're rather cheap for schools to buy, and Arduino, because we know there's a lot of them already in schools. That's fabulous. Well, thank you very much, Kerry. So, Kerry, you you often join us in our jam jar session, which takes place after talks. Are you planning yep. to do that this evening? I should be around. Yes. Fantastic. So we can we can go and chat there afterwards and find out Perfect. about some of the other things that you we've talked about previously. Well, thank you very much, Kerry. Um, and now we have. Um, he's just oh, he's just had to nip it back into makeup for a moment. Oh, now he's coming out. We've got Stuart, who's going to be talking to us about a robot cocktail mixer. And um, Stuart will be there somewhere. He's just getting, oh, he, he, it looks like I can see Stuart's slides. And I don't know if Stuart's planning on okay. his camera. Oh, his camera's on as well. Brilliant, Stuart. Okay. When you're ready. Thank you, Alan. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about how I built a robot, robot um, cocktail maker. Uh, so first of all, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Stuart. Uh, I'm a teacher in South London. I teach secondary school computing uh, and computer science. Um, I'm part of a makerspace called the South London Makerspace, and I'm also a Coda Dojo champion. So before um, before lockdown last year, I was running um, Coda Dojo uh, monthly workshops at uh, down in South London. Um, so that's me. So a few years ago, I turned 30 and I decided to uh, give myself a project and I decided to make a bar bot. And here's a picture of me and my stepdad with my uh, bar bot in the background. And um, this bar bot 
well, why did I make it? Well, first of all, um, as I said, I wanted to make something for my birth, uh, my party. I was inspired by a bar bot that I had, I had seen at a festival called the EMF Festival, EMF Camp Festival in 2016, uh, which is like a makers festival. It's a really, a really nice, chilled, cool place where you can just meet um, and create stuff um, in a field. So I, I was getting, um, yeah, they have like full internet, electricity, everything. It's great. And I saw a bar bot there and I thought that would be really cool to make one day. And I thought this was a perfect, op perfect opportunity to create my own. So first of all, uh, I wanted to create it. So I had to, first of all, decompose what I needed to actually create this bar bot. Now, I, um, I can do basic electronics. I work with Raspberry Pis, Arduinos and things like this. Um, I understand kind of the stepper motors and things like things like that. But what wasn't great about was the construction. And that's where my stepdad um, came in. He's a builder. So he helped me build the frame. And then um, I thought about how was I going to get the liquid to the cup. And I ended up deciding to go with a left right horizontal motion of the cup um, with a actuator to dispense the liquid when it was in the right place. So I then went about sourcing some parts. I managed to find one meter metal rods, which you can just see about at the bottom. If I move my little pointer here, are these kind of two metal rods to keep it stable. Uh, and I found one meter length, so I decided to make the, the um, whole thing one meter. Uh, the actuator, which is this part here, goes up and down and pushes against the bar optic to dispense. Uh, got some bar optics up online. I use a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino and stepper motors, and there's a belt that goes along to make it go left and right. So how did it work? As I said, the stepper motor was used to make it to go left and right. Um, there was a belt connected to the stepper motor, and as you can see, it goes um, along. Once it gets to the correct optic, the actuator will, the linear actuator will push the optic in place to dispense the liquid. Uh, now I can I control this both with a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino because um, I was short of time essentially, and I couldn't get the stepper motor working with um, with the Raspberry Pi. I was having issues with it, so. But I, I knew I could get it working with an Arduino. So I then, so I got the stepper motor in working with the Arduino and I in, connected the Arduino to the Raspberry Pi to, um, to control that. I also wanted an interface where my guests could uh, select their drink and they it allowed them to select their drink and also create their own cocktail. So you could, you could make your own combinations of um, spirits to create your own cocktail. And I used a framework called Flask, which is a Python framework. Python works very well with the Raspberry Pi. And as you can see, you can just scroll down on your phone, select the drink you want, and it will kick into action. Um, it was quite fun. People, it was like a, a good kind of like, yeah, a good thing to, to have at, the, at a party. It meant I didn't have to pour any drinks. People could just go, go up, self-serve, log in, and get the drinks that they wanted. Now, what issues did I face? Well, um, the platform did tilt a little bit too much. And if you look at the uh, platform where the drink stands, I had to kind of like screw on a bit of wood so it didn't tilt forwards, which we'll just show in a moment. There we go. You can see just a bit of wood screwed onto the front just to keep it stable. The Raspberry Pi did crash quite a few times. I'm not quite sure how. Um, we don't know quite sure why it crashed, but it just it did. But just a restart fixed and Wi-Fi issues. I had quite a number, quite a few guests at my party, and our home Wi-Fi hub could not um, cope with the amount of wireless devices. So that was another thing to consider. Okay, so what could I improve on? Well, end stops. I, I was very short on time re making this project. End stops would have been really useful at both ends of the platform. So if it went wrong, it could automatically cut out. And also um, when it did crash, 
I would have to manually move the platform to the center of the bar bot before turning on the Pi, otherwise it would have just continued and broke. Uh, so if it could self collaborate, that would also have been quite useful. A cup sensor would also have been an, a, a useful addition. Um, so it wouldn't start if it could if it didn't detect a cup in the uh, on the platform. I would have liked to add some kind of RGB LEDs, make some flashing lights, make it look cool. I wanted to add a soft drink uh, dispenser, a mixer dispenser, but I had the issue of I couldn't I couldn't dispense liquid uh, fizzy drinks essentially. Anything fizzy wasn't um, working. I managed to find a pump that can pump um, liquids. And I've, I've forgotten the name of that pump now, but it's essentially like a tube uh, with a motor inside that kind of has like some bearings to push the liquid through. Uh, the problem with that was um, it made the fizzy drinks flat because as it was pushing the liquid through, it essentially got rid of the bubbles. So that was completely useless. And I, and I couldn't find another way to dispense fizzy liquids in time. So unfortunately it had to be done. That's the uh, that's the pump here yeah, in the chat. Um, I would like to add some kind of like fruit dispenser, like, I don't know, having some kind of like conveyor belt where a little lemon could slide in to the top. That would be quite cool. Uh, ice dispenser would have been quite cool. But again, adding an ice dispenser would have just been too much. And as all with, I'm sure with lots of projects, cable management, cables were just going everywhere. It was, um, it was not good, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I got some masking tape and just stuck the table, cables on. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions, but um, yeah, it's, thank you. If it's okay, Stuart, I'm just letting somebody ar arrive and I'll probably the person who's just arrived, I'm just gonna send them to the green room just for a moment so they can get set up. So Stuart, um, what an amazing project. I remember you telling me about this a few years ago and you showed me this little image on your phone and I thought, nah, it, it, it will never have really worked because <laughs> um, well, I think what prompted the conversation was I had seen, I said, I'd been to a festival, it was at the Barbican. And one of the things that this festival they said, oh, for 15 pounds, you can have a robot make a cocktail for you. And I went along, now I didn't pay the 15 pounds and I'm glad I didn't. And I went with a friend of ours called Joe. And this thing was absolutely huge. I would say for like the bottles of vodka, it probably had like 15 bottles of vodka all stacked up ready, Tia Maria and all these kind of things. And these huge big robot arms that look like the kind of ones used to assemble cars it must have cost a hundred thousand pounds or more. And the other thing was it kept breaking down. Like I would say every minute, every two minutes and Joe and I had a, a proper laugh watching this thing. But what sounds amazing is you've, imagined, you've managed to build something with a higher success rate than this thing, which has been, oh, and the other thing I didn't mention is it had four members of staff operating the thing. I thought, what's the point in having a robot making cocktails? You're having to pay four people to stand around. Um, it kept getting the measures wrong. Uh, some of the optics didn't open and close as quite as efficiently, perhaps. And you ended up with things being thrown about all over the place. It looks like you did a brilliant job of it. Did you consider whether it might have been better to place certain bottles closer together to reduce the travel time? between? Um, I suppose I didn't really think about where it was placed. I did have all the spirits um, at one end and I think I had a lemon juice or something flat on the on the end um, or, or something like that. But no, I didn't I didn't particularly have any desire about putting them in any what in any, any specific order. I would like to have added maybe a um, some kind of support to the cup and made the belt go left and right a bit faster um, because it, it was quite slow. But the, the other problem I had was I couldn't get the motor driver to go any faster than that. I, I, my, my knowledge of stepper motors was very, and still is, <laughs> very little. I, I don't fully understand the, um, all of the workings. But yeah, as, as soon as I tried to turn the speed up uh, any more, it just kind of like froze and got stuck. What, what might have also been interesting as well, I'm considering other 
certainly from an educational perspective, modeling other systems where, uh, say, a piece of technology is delivering a service or a product to people at the point of demand. So, for example, um, there is a ride sharing service. And I was I was wondering, like your cocktails, if people have to pay for cocktails and whether you thought, oh, actually, to make this particular cocktail, the robot has to travel a lot of distance. And in order to do that, that is costing me time because the queue is increasing and people are going away. So we could offer people cocktails that were cheaper or easier to make at, at peak times. You could have this sort of fluid pricing, fluid pricing. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but to encourage people and whether also you might think, oh, do you know what? Uh, Tia Maria's are very popular. So what we might do is we might keep certain bottles closer together because we know that and the data it might be collected you know it's just i think it's an interesting template for a talking project. about data as well it did also collect data on how many drinks were ordered which was quite a nice little um touch so you could see as as i said um you people could create their own cocktail mixes you could also see at the end uh, whose cocktails was more important uh, but yeah there's lots of kind of thing on an educational point of view to take away from this you can Think about how, you know, how could you decompose it further, getting the positions of the um, of the drink underneath the spirits. Could I just you know, mathematics? Could I just subtract the distance in uh, between each bottle or could I work it in a different way with time, etc.? John has just suggested in the YouTube chat as well that another solution might have been to have the bottles on a rotating table. The, that could be that, that's a, that's the I suppose that's the other way of do, of of doing it. You either get the cup to the spirit, <laughs> or you get the spirit to the cup. And I I think the idea of having a, I suppose how I suppose how many optics do you have? If you have too many optics, having all of that spinning could be quite dangerous because you wouldn't want it to topple over. That's right. And if you have, say, lots of one, you know, if you have an imbalanced table, you're having to consider you know if it wears down on on one end absolutely fascinating project and i'm so glad you you shared it with us um have you had any ideas about brian may or tech on tour or growing things i can think i can see something growing behind you at the moment i've got a few things growing behind me actually i've got a few i've got a few daffodils which are which I've, um sprung open a few days ago which was really nice and i've got a few plants on the side um, but I, I'll have to think about it. I, I know <laughs> that I, this plant, I don't know if you can see above on my top of my shelves, yes, is, yeah. is, is, is a little bit sad at the moment because I forgot to water it and then I watered it too much. And now it is kind of trying to be recovered. So maybe I might need to look at a project about having some kind of sensor to remind me to water it at the right time. So I don't over or under water. So maybe humidity maybe control. Start. It's kind of like a cocktail dispenser for plants that only dispenses water when they need it. That would be perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stuart. Right. Thanks, We're going to move on now to our next presenter this evening. Is Brian. Brian has is bringing along a uh, he's going to speak to us about controlling a Raspberry Pi robot over the web or LAN. Um, Brian, are you there? I yeah, I'm here. Is, I think, Brian, this may be the first time to join us at one of our jam events. Is that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so, yes. Well, you, you certainly bided your time. We, we're up to about 110 or something like that. But can I say, Brian, it's so lovely to see you here. And for people who who don't know or don't follow Brian on Twitter, Brian has these most amazing, wonderful, creative ideas for projects. He shares some of them on Twitter. And Brian and I, we've met each other as a number of maker fairs throughout the past, obviously not in the last 12 months. Um, and you, with members of your family, will often travel to these fairs, won't you? And you will show off particular projects. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. All, all the part of making for me is is is, is showing off. I um, it's um, I, I it sets deadlines for me. I'm very bad with deadlines. <laughs> Having a make affair to get ready for is something like I have this deadline set in stone, so it it forces the creativity to yeah. to make. Otherwise, I just procrastinate for months over something. I just want to take this opportunity for saying thank you. I've got some photos in the past when I've seen some of your projects on display at Maker Fairs and people walk away going like, did you see that? 
did you see that project over there? Whoa, you know. So, um, right, tell us about controlling a Raspberry Pi robot via web or LAN. So as part of um, doing down with lockdown, um, the part of the, the um, Pi Wars competition, it, uh, you always used to be Pi New, and it's having uh, two robots um, oh, uh, in, in a battle uh, trying to pop each other's balloon. And I wanted to recreate this um, on, uh, virtually. And so I had to come up with a way of being able to control a robot over the internet. So I've created this um, this web interface. Uh, let me show a video of it. So I'm saying that there's this thing. You see that at the mo moment on on the thing is that the uh, the wheel disk on the screen is controlling the robot and got a live video feed. Um, and the, the D-pad gives slight full directional control. And uh, I wanted to uh, be able to share this with everybody. Uh, so I have have released the, um, the source code and that on, on the internet, and I'm just going to run through of how to, uh, uh, um, how, how, how to, put, how to for, for you to, to, you know, recreate this on your own robot. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and the code I got is ready to run. So let's go. I'm just going to change to screen share to video. Yeah. Uh, I didn't do it right. Let's right. let's let's start that again. Yep, that's fine. It's we can see it now. Remote test bed. That's it. So test bed is the name of my robot. Um, and so okay, let me talk through that again. Um, as you can see, the disc is controlling. The robot uh, that mixes the um, the left and right motors of the robot and give you a nice smooth control. Um, the thing, and as you can see, that the video is being transmitted live from the robot. So okay. So let me now. So that and share. Sorry about this. Right. Okay, so see your slides, yep. Yeah. I just need to have a change on. So okay. So what software do do we need to to, to be able to 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 create this? So First of all, I use the Flask library to create the web app. Um, it, it, you saw it being in use on the um, on the cocktail mixer um, and thing. And for the video, I found a project on GitHub called StreamEye um, that created everything that needed to be able to broadcast the Raspberry Pi camera. And then my own project is saying it, it's on the web uh, web robot control. Um, and it's saying you can download it from GitHub. Um, if then there is only a single version on there at the moment, it's got three different index phases of more complex things. So it's got a uh, basic um, cross uh, D pad control, then it's got D pad and circle control, and then it's got a page with the video. Um, the instructions on uh, on GitHub on the readme tell you how to um, access those different features. So how does it actually work? It's saying, well, the user interface, so your web browser sends a, a URL request to the, um, to the web server, and you actually tell, tell it, so well, I want the motor functions, and I want it to do this, either turn left, turn right, something is, and in this example, you can see, um, and you can see here that I'm asking for the motors to turn off. And in the actual web app, it's, it's done by this thing. So it uses the root, uh, which this is the, so the function name of the, the motor part. And then the action is off. And you can see here, I've, I've still I've stripped out some of the code. So it's, it's so hopefully it's be visible. Um, and um, yeah, so the same, you know, if function name equals motor, and if action equals things, and then it calls the function stop motors. 
and uh, the thing. So I just thought I'd go quickly over the interface and so this has been just a little bit re rejigged. So we've got video. It's a live stream from the video uh, camera. Um, and uh, for on, on my home network, I was able to do comfortably do 15 frames a second. Uh, for on the web, I dropped it down to 10 uh, to hopefully make it so it's a little bit less daggy. Okay. And you can see that we've got the D-pad controls, which that can also be controlled by the keys on the key on your keyboard. And, uh, and then we've got the um, the circle pad for controlling the motors, and that mixes uh, the motors from left and right. And it, it, it also um, it's able so that if you so like click on the far left or right, it'll, the robot will spin. Whereas uh, the other in if you slide more forward or, or back uh, to the left and right, it makes a graceful arc. And then at the bottom here is some like um, debugging information, which is a helpful thing. Um, also, saying so that if you're having problems uh, when you're in the web browser, if you press uh, function 12, it pulls up the uh, the web browser debugging information, and that helps a lot of information. Also, the program does actually send um, information to the console as well. Um, so. What you will need to do is, is to adjust the, um, the code for your motor controller. Um, and these are the sort of things. So here you put in your own uh, motor driver. Um, I think I to uh, repeat it a bit. Yeah. And uh, also, as saying also, um, you create a motor object and but you're saying you need to do this for your for your own thing um the next part is um here is is function so this is the the function that sets the speed and stop that motor's functions you will need to change these lines here to suit your motor controller and finally we've got the mixer function here uh this is the bit that creates the the uh, the uh, the throttle and the, the steering left and right and mixes it into um, something that makes sense um, to to give you some like reasonable control over the robot. Uh, you may as it works from minus one to to one. You may need to adjust the output to suit your motor controller. And uh, fine. so as saying, there's more information on. On the GitHub at uh, Open Robotics, uh, the thing, and that, I, saw, I guess that's where. Um, that's fab brain. Can we leave that link on the screen just for a moment? Because yeah, of one of the things that a few people were commenting on in the live chat on YouTube. So we had uh, Stephen Amor, who you, you might have heard. I was apologising earlier. <laughs> Um, so Stephen, and if you would have said it's really, really useful that you're sharing the code and for people who've never heard of GitHub before, it's, it's a fantastic place where people can share uh, source code of projects that they're working on. And some people had said that the, the code that you're sharing was very nicely written. And um, it, it, is ni it is nice to see when other people share their code just as, it, you know, an artist sharing their artwork or um a writer sharing something so that's so thank you so much for doing that um and michael's just saying in the chat he's he's wants to have a a play oh he's just had a quick play test and he says it's it's amazing fun it's great fun so brian thank you so much for sharing that and i don't know if you're going to go over and watch the live stream but i wonder if you or somebody else could grab that url and just paste it in there. oh uh, yeah I, 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 I can get that dropped into the um into the chat um, oh, we do have a quick question from Eddie Rose. Um, he says, how does it connect over the Internet? Well, I'm sorry, Eddie, we do need to move into our next talk. But I'm sure um, Brian has, Brian will probably answer that on Twitter if you want to connect with him or in the chat, somebody else may if Brian doesn't do that. Oh, did you hear what I said? Brian may do that. Sorry, we're getting uh, infections from Brian May coming over. So, um Please, yeah, uh, Brian, if you could go over there and answer that question for Eddie Rose, is how yeah, is it on the internet? Okay, so we're going to go to our next presenter, or I could say, il prossimo, B 
because um, I'm guessing with a name like Alessandro, he is perhaps Perché Italiano? Good guess. Ah, okay. I'm good guess. Uh, Italian. Uh, I'm Italian. Okay. Mi dispiace. Uh, sono nato in Irlanda. <laughs> sono Irlandese. Okay. So apologies. Uh, that's to not me. your fault. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> it was my mother's fault. Okay. So um, Alessandro's name, I've seen it crop up a few times when we've been doing our jams in the past, and I kept wanting to, you know, find out, is Alessandro, are you joining us in the UK as, as you're here this evening, or are you? No, actually, no, no, this is the first time. It's the first time, but I'm, I'm sure it will be the first of a long, uh, you know, and uh, regular attendance. Okay. I find it very, very exciting. And I joined other sessions, other, other uh, um, online uh, conferences, which I found very exciting. Yeah. exciting. That's why, you know, I was uh, happy to, to join and to propose my robot to this audience as well. Okay, so I'm going to wish you good luck. I'm going to try as an Italian. So I'm going to say, buona fortuna <laughs> con il... Uh, prima volta, is that right? No. Correct, right, right, that's right. Okay, okay. So, so, great. So, Alessandro is here with us this evening. He's going to talk to us about an autonomous driving Raspberry Pi robot. This seems to be a, a recurring theme this evening. So, Alessandra, All right. over to All you. Right. Okay. Here we go. So, I'm sharing with you my slides. And uh, so we can jump into business. So um, first of all, I have to admit that this is my first uh, robot. Uh, and you know, when I came to know Raspberry Pi and I made the first experiments, I said to myself, wow, that's really a fantastic uh, computer. This is really an amazing device. I can make my childhood dream come true. And my childhood dream was to build my own robot. And this is where we are today. And you know, for that purpose, I wanted to give also a name of the robot, which was quite, you know, important and a bit presumptuous. That's why I call it Ulisse. Ulisse is uh, the uh, epic traveler from uh, the Homeric uh, poem, uh, The Odyssey. And it stands for Universal Lander for Interstellar Space Exploration. I mean, it's quite presumptuous, I know it, but please bear with me. It's just, you know, a childhood dream come true. I could not really give it uh, a humble name. I also gave it this acronym, HPC, which stands for High Performance Computing. And this is the core, and I think, uh, you know, a bit uh, the novelty that I'm glad to show you in, uh, in a few seconds. Here, I also reported the GitHub repository where I shared my uh, code. And, you know, I'm more than happy if you can play with it, take it, uh, also ask me questions. I'll be more than happy to share any talk, thought that you may have. So now, going a bit more in the uh, core of the discussion, the main feature, I mean, here is a very high level summary. And uh, as uh, Alan said, this is a self-driving robot. Uh, there is no steering via keyboard or remote control or whatsoever. It's two-wheel drive for uh, um, energy savings reason. It is steered via object tracking using, using uh, OpenCV. And based on the position of the ball on the screen, then the robot determines the direction to go, whether left, right, back and forth, and so on. Then there is a, a distance sensor mounted in the servo motor. And then I also added additional uh, um, components and sensors like a GPS, like a 3D axis uh, uh, accelerometer, a compass, an LCD screen to project some information like temperature, temperature and humidity. And I also installed uh, a shift register with eight LEDs. I mean, if, if we look at it from, uh, let's say a mobility standpoint, uh, the robot, may be sufficiently equipped with a, with a distance sensor, with the engine, of course, with uh, the engine controller, not that much. We don't, we don't need all these components, of course. But you know, uh, because I wanted to materialize my childhood dream, I was, let's say, trying to push the, the, the Raspberry Pi to the limit and understand how much I could push, let's say, its limit forward 
and then uh, install and use as many components as possible. And I mean, some of these uh, were not really useful levers for, for driving, like for example, a shift register with the eight left is just you know a nice uh, thing to see, but really not adding much value, like even temperature humidity. But again, my, in my mind, and I will show you at the end of the speech where I'm going with my mind, with my idea, I really wanted to test the full computational capability of the, of the tool. And I also implemented a task farm high performance computing framework using the MPI for PI library. I will talk about this in a sec. So please, uh, Let's, uh, let's look uh, um, another moment in this slide, especially on the uh, right corner. This is exactly what the robot sees as it goes forward uh, toward the ball. So in real time, uh, the, the robot uh, captures all these different elements, all these different information and projects it to the screen for, you know, to give a bit of a sci-fi vision and perspective. If we go to the technical specs, you see that uh, uh, these are very standard components. I didn't, uh, I didn't reinvent the wheel at all. But as soon as I installed all these components in the, on the Raspberry Pi and, try and test it out, it, can, it came out uh, a clear limitation of, uh, of, the, of, of this device. Of course, it's a fantastic tool, but of course, uh, it's not uh, super fast. It doesn't have uh, you know, a, a GPU and for computational uh, perspective, this is really a strong limitation, especially when all these components are built together in real time, uh, per, uh, analyzing the environment, take decisions, uh, and also elaborate uh, in, with OpenCV the, um, the images to capture the yellow ball on the screen. And in order to cope with that limitation, I installed the, uh, or implemented the high performance uh, computing uh, framework. I don't know how many of you, uh, of you are, are familiar with this concept. This is actually uh, what, uh, how it looks like, more or less. So on the left side, we see a standard you know, um, structure of a software code to, that can be implemented in any robot to analyze and to, and to uh, invoke the individual individual uh, sensor and components, and then you know, do, do whatever manipulation, whatever analysis is needed. On the right hand side, we see the structure of the high performance computing framework. So, in essence, as you can see from uh, the uh, command here below, basically six instances of the same software are executed at, uh, at the same time. Why six? Because each instance execute one set of processes. A subset of the entire code is uh, you know, dedicated to each one of these process, uh, uh, processes. The rank zero, so the, the controller of, the, of the, all the uh, sub processes is called the lord of the processes because one process ruled them all. It, it just, uh, just controls the other, it doesn't do anything else. While the uh, first, the rank number one uh, process uh, controls the camera frame, analyze uh, uh, the environment, execute all the uh, machine learning algorithms to, ana to, uh, to analyze the environment to identify the ball. Then uh, we have the rank number two, uh, process, which invokes the motors and the direction. Then we have the rank number three, GPS, the, the, the um, temperature and humidity, compass accelerometer. Ramp number four, the shift register, the LED, uh, and, uh, and the LCD screen. And then the rank, rank number five invokes the distance sensor and the servo. So as you can see, there is, this, uh, there, is a, um, there is a quite a substantial difference from a computational point of view between the two framework on the right hand side every component every 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 task every process is dedicated to, to one specific task there is an additional element and this this is the price to play to pay when we play with uh, the high performance computing is the communication between these different processes of course for example to project screen 
uh, on, on the LCD information, uh, uh, for example, like the DTH, uh, temperature and humidity needs to travel a bit from, uh, from the rank number three process to the lord of the process and then come back to number four. I could even uh, create and establish a direct link and direct communication channel between these two processes, the three and the four. But you know, in order to avoid uh, synchronization problems, then I prefer to, let's say, uh, go through the lot of the process and let him uh, doing his job, which is controlling the entire uh, framework. So this is basically the new structure. And this is possible because in the end, the software code does not require uh, so much uh, memory. I mean, I've used, uh, I've used um, the Raspberry Pi 3B, so with one gig uh, uh, of RAM, and, uh, and then the six instances of the, of the same code in the end uh, uh, required um, 500 meg, if I recall correctly. So it's still doable from a memory point of view. And from a computational point of view, I mean, uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite improved, uh, it's a quite improved performance, especially because, you know, all these different processes are executed independently from one to the other and not executed in sequence, like uh, in a standard, in a standard, uh, let's say, uh, software, uh, software version. Alessandro? Please. Um, as we're getting, like, we've just gone over time slightly, can I make a few comments is that okay Please. yeah what what is very very striking and remarkable um one is i see very strong parallels between this and the work of the nasa team you know developing the the mars rovers the i think they call it autonomous planetary terrain where the because there's this distance of telemetry sort of 300 million miles or something a lot of the rovercraft have to make a lot of decisions for themselves. So that, that's the first thing. And I thought like, wow, this gentleman here, he's, he's working on projects like NASA, but <laughs> within his own home. And the second thing was you've, you've managed to solve a, an extremely complicated and dif uh, you know, difficult uh, challenge in a very, very smart and clever way. So it's been, it's been lovely to see this. Well, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the kind words. And I have shared your Twitter handle in the tweets, sorry, in the messages on the. On, and so I hope that some people will be sending you some messages. Now, um, we did have a question from Daniel Palladini. His surname sounds a little bit uh, como italiano. <laughs> and I know that Daniel yeah. is a friend of mine. But... Ah, you're just trying to boost the numbers <laughs> by bringing your friends along. So he's asking about success with GPS indoors and how you might work around that. Is it possible you could go to the live stream, the, the chat on YouTube, and you could answer your friend Daniel's questions? Of course. Okay. Of course. Thank you so much. And I hope to you guys. We, we have another presenter coming up next, Gary, who... And I'm, if I'm certain, Gary has been here every month to talk about his robot project. And I can see lots of parallels between these projects tonight. So um, hopefully we will see Alessandro in the jam jar a little bit later on and we can ask and discuss these sorts of things. Now, Gary, it looks like there's been an incredible swelling of viewers. The numbers have just suddenly increased on, <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> And I guess that's because people know, oh, what time is Gary on? What time is Gary on, Alan? And we've just got so used to you coming along every month to update us. And, and I think you've got some bad news for us tonight, haven't you? Well, uh, only bad news in so far as if you were hoping to see more progress on the humanoid robot, then I'm... Well, this isn't directly concerned with it. It's kind of indirectly concerned with it. So I'm going to be showing you something um, a little bit smaller tonight, uh, but hopefully what I show you tonight will eventually feed into the big robot project. Everything I do, including the slime mold that I showed you last month, it's all eventually will feed into that bigger project. Okay, so shall I carry on from here then?
Please do. Ready for Joe. Right. Okay. So uh, yes, indeed. I um, well, welcome to everybody. Um, as Alan has just said, I've been on here most months showing um, various aspects of my robot projects, and I came up with something a little bit different this month because, uh, well, the title was March of the Robots, so I thought well, it's time we had something that actually uh, marches. So, um, so I made this. It's um, it's a little four-legged walker that will um, march along. Now. As well as creating the, the walker, which was something I've been wanting to do for some time now, it also gave me an opportunity to be the first person to use the Raspberry Pi Pico in a project on the RJAM. So uh, basically, it just gave me an excuse to play around with the Pico and to start playing around with some walkers. And my aim with this was to create something which would act as an experimental platform so that I can actually build on it and eventually I'll be able to get it to do lots of, of different things. In the course of a month, I've actually created the, uh, the mechanism, I've put in the electronics and I programmed it up so it will walk, which I'll demonstrate to you in a few minutes. And then as the weeks, months go by, then I'm planning on getting this to do more things, including hopefully a surprise project for next month. So um, I got the design for the walker itself off the internet, Thanks to Alan, because he posted some links to a number of uh, possible project ideas at the start of the month. So that if anybody was unsure of what they might do, they could go out along and have a look. So I went along and had a look and I found the design for the 3D printout of this walker. And I thought, well, not much point in reinventing the wheel or in my case, reinventing the leg. Uh, I might as well use a design that someone has already tried and tested. And this particular design, this 3D design has been out now probably about four or five years. Most of the time when people have implemented it and haven't been that many, um, certainly visible on YouTube and the like, but when they have done it, they've usually used one of the Arduino uh, microcontrollers, in particular the Quadduino, which is specifically designed for um, server motors to be plugged into it. But I wanted to have a go with the Pico, so I um, decided that I'd try and make it in a way that would allow me to not actually damage my Pico too much. And so it just turned out, I think it's just sheer, sheer coincidence, that when I printed this thing out, uh, a piece of breadboard, that white protoboard on there, fits almost exactly on top of the robot. In the original design, the idea was all electronics would actually be put inside the uh, the hollow case down at the bottom end there. But I've perched that on top of there, and it means that I've now got a platform which I can actually use to experiment with. I can add more electronics and sensors and things on there as time goes by. So um, the programming of the thing, um, I, I, I've used MicroPython, which is built into the uh, to the Pico. And uh, Python's a language I'm relatively familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, my code is not the elegant code that uh, people were praising earlier on. So um, it isn't available for public consumption, unless you want a copy of it, in which case just ask me and I'll email it to you. Uh, but what I, my aim here was really was to have something which was, um, which was gonna work and which wouldn't involve too much time and effort on my part in trying to optimize it. And I also didn't want to get into any particular, particularly heavy maths, because what I did discover was that a few people, when they have created robots like uh, this sort or other types, have said, oh, you must master inverse kinematics first. Well, inverse kinematics for some people is relatively straightforward maths. Personally, I found it a bit hard going. So I thought, well, I'll just take a simple approach to doing this. So all I did to make the robot work was draw a diagram. There it is on paper. You can probably see there those square boxes represent the robot's body and the sticks sticking out the side of it represent the legs at various angles and at various extensions. And all I did was um, just basically set the robot's legs to those positions and made a note of the numbers. And you can see the numbers I've put in the table there, just 48 of them. Typed all those numbers into my <laughs> Python program, just one, almost just one long script basically, and then just squirted them through the program. And then the robot walked, amazingly. So I'll demonstrate it to you now so you can see how it looks. I'll just switch cameras. So you should now get a bird's eye view. And there's the robot. Um, so that's on, on the floor here. Now, what I wanted to do is to have something which could actually get over a bit of an obstacle course, because my plan is to use this thing out in the garden at some point. Watch this space next month to find out uh, how that's going to happen. 
So I needed some slightly rough terrain. I'm not having it scramble over rockeries and borders and so on. It'll be mostly the lawn, but if there's any unevenness there, I wanted to be able to cope with it. So we'll switch on and we'll get it to run. Okay, so off it goes. Now it tends to be a bit lazy and um, actually it's gotten and it tends to go off to one side and it's not careful. At the moment there are no sensors on there so it doesn't Looks like it's, this. it's, um, it's the it's line of least the resistance. Camera. There it goes. Right, now I'll give you a different view of it. So you can see it down here. Okay, let's switch that off. And so we've got a promising start there. Obviously, it's less than perfect at the moment, and it does need to have some sensors added to it. But that's the plan over the next few months. So um, watch this space for further developments. That's absolutely fantastic. See, who needs Boston Dynamics when, when we've got <laughs> such a, amazing projects coming out of bedrooms and kitchens and people's studies? Um, and can I also say it's so refreshing to see a pile of magazines on the floor, not to see, you know, seeing so many Zoom bookcases, people showing off. It's nice to see, you know, uh, <laughs> being put to, to, to really good use. Um, I, you know, I think robots is, is a theme that we should definitely revisit at, at different times because it does, it does show, uh, uh, as, as you do every month, just how many different directions there are that projects can can head off in and um, you know we still have a few more talks to go this evening. Gary could I ask um, just reflect back to a year or two ago if I'd said to you Gary in the year 2021 you'll have a walking robot a robot that can catch a ball throw a ball at would you have thought I was any more crazy than you already thought I was? <laughs> um, no, because I, I mean, like a lot of the people on here, particularly the younger people, ever since I was very young, I've been interested in the idea of robots and, and wanted to you know, create one of my own. Um, but of course, it's only in the last few years, last handful of years, really, that things like the the, the Pico and and the Raspberry Pi and the, uh, the um, Arduino and so on have come along, which has actually made it possible. You, you know, just look at some of the sensors that are out there now, things like um, uh, gyroscopes and so on. I mean, they're, they're there was something like $1,100 just a decade ago. And now you can buy one for, you know, a couple of quid. Uh, and so you can do things now that it just simply wasn't possible to do. The technology wasn't there and it was prohibitively expensive uh, even when it was. So, uh, yeah, I would have believed that, that uh, it would have happened. I wouldn't have thought some of it would have happened quite as quickly as it has, I have to say. But uh, it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I've lived long enough to be able to <laughs> this stuff <laughs> i mean I, we are running a little bit over yeah, at the yeah. moment, but but i'm thinking you know Stuart came on earlier and Stuart talked about a project the the, co the robotic cocktail maker that yeah. i've seen people create on an industrial scale yeah alessandro's been on talk about an autonomous rover which is the same thing that nasa and it is it is just incredible that there's yeah. so many resources out there that we can use even without having access to a 3d printer yeah. and we can yeah. build well, yes, I mean, for yeah. example, I mean, this was the first, because I made another walking robot this month, which I haven't shown you, that, <laughs> it, although it's made with a 3D printer, the legs there, they could be made out of pieces of bent coat hanger wire if you wanted Or cardboard to. even. Yes, and it's just it's just three servos glued together, and that will actually walk. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't have time to show that tonight, so um, you'll have to ask on another occasion. And we did have, and I think we have a video of it. We we had a few years ago. We um, somebody came to our jam in Preston and demonstrated a robot that could walk up walls. Yeah. Um, and I've seen, and you know, that was a f maybe four years ago. And yeah. uh, we'll see, yeah. Gary. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping we'll see maybe your other robots return yeah. kind of gardening project next month. Yep. Yeah. Um. Would they be able to do the month after some kind of lead guitar performance on stage at Wembley, perhaps? Well, funny, funny you should say that. 
you know, it's, that's already got my mind racing. Yeah. So, uh, and then yeah. we'll have to figure out how to take it on tour as we look about how we take our tech on tour. You know, the, so yeah, um, it's, it's a possibility. Yeah, a, a robot you can ride on that can do all of those things and can fly off to exotic locations. Possibly. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Gary right, we have welcome. two more talks this evening. Coming up next, do we have? Paul, Dr. Footleg, who is now designing better robots. And then the, we've got their finale this evening, which is Mike Horn, one of the founding members of Pi Wars, and he's going to discuss the journey that they've been on. Thank you, everybody who's on the being on the YouTube chat. Uh, please keep chatting. Um, and remember, at about 8.30 to 8.45, we are heading over to our jam jar where you can join us. They're basically breakout rooms. And um, so, Paul, are you, are you going to be she sharing your screen? I'm going to be screen sharing. Yep. And Do you want to set that up while I just explain about the jam jar for people who've never joined us before? So it's an informal, we probably have two or three breakout rooms. And we suggest people go in, chat for a few minutes, listen. Um, and we've had some people who English is not their first language and they're happy just to, to go in and listen to see what's going on in those uh, that jam jar session. Now, I, I, you might have noticed I've put a few messages in the chat on YouTube this evening. One of those is just to remind you that we, we do like to collect and read and act on feedback. And we, every month we post a link and maybe two or three people fill in the form so i suppose that's a good thing because it means if people are not filling the form in they're not complaining <laughs> but it is nice to hear suggestions and one of the things we never really do is afterwards ask people about the jam jars and how well that went and went and it's something that we are working and discussing whether there's things we could do to improve how they work so please find the form it should only take you a minute or two to fill it in Paul, welcome. We're so glad you could come and join us this evening. Happy to be here. Tell us about how to design better robots. So let me show you a short video to set the scene. Um, this is a robot which I originally put together about a year ago. And it it was a lot of fun. There's basically two plates of acrylic with motors and wheels bolted on, all the electronics stuck on the top. And uh, it ran extremely fast. And uh, it was actually built as a test bed for robot control hardware I was designing. And the problem was that because the robot was so fast and it was able to kind of like roll kind of like around the room because you you try and turn and it would it was just going to like a barrel roll all of the pins on the top of the uh the um the add-on board got bent horribly out of shape um you could also see in the um at the start of the video clip pause it um, the battery was sellotaped onto the top for the Raspberry Pi. There's the separate batteries underneath that are um, providing power to the um, to the motors. But the whole thing was a bit kind of Heath Robinson. And that's often how robots start. Even when you buy a kit, um, this is kind of based on the idea of the tiny four wheel drive kit that Brian Cortiel um, designed. And you get the kind of acrylic plates and the, and the wheels and motors. Um, but then it's kind of left to the to the user to decide how to um, how to kind of attach everything else and, and you can bolt everything on, but it all ends up kind of piled on top and you try and work out where to kind of fit a battery. And I thought there's a lot that could be designed better about this. So I've been on a project to really kind of take that idea and actually design a really um, well-designed robot. Um, and what I've done is I've, Put the whole thing into the um, CAD program and um, I've designed better motor brackets so that they actually completely cover the motors and gearboxes so that there's no dirt ingress into those. And then I've moved the electronics onto the bottom tier so that they're protected inside the, um, the chassis from the knocks and scrapes when it, it gets when it rolls about. Um, my electronics actually ended up quite tall because 
I've also been developing power solutions. Um, in the original robot, you saw that battery that was bolted onto the outside um, for the Raspberry Pi, but I really wanted to take all the power from the main lithium batteries. Um, and so I've built this um, power regulator board, which is tucked in here, you can see the heat sink on it, um, that can provide all the power that the Raspberry Pi needs. And then that's kind of like a sandwich. So I've got a couple of headers just to give the clearance over the, over the components. Um, and then my board on the top kind of sticks through. So to protect that and the LED array that's plugged onto the secondary header on my board, I've got a couple of roll bars. So that was the next addition was kind of like, how do I protect? So when you see side on, everything's kind of protected from kind of scraping along the floor by those roll bars. And then if I just take some of those top parts away so we can see the insides a bit better. Um, the batteries are now bolted on. In fact, they're bolted on with bolts that also double up as the motor bolt. So if I hide the batteries, you can see that I've got the screws that go through. Um, and I've actually, to make a bit more space and keep everything symmetrical on the top, moved the Raspberry Pi across so that this pillar of the Raspberry Pi stack is also one of the kind of six pillars supporting the top plate. Um, you can see on, on this side, we've got um, separate pillars because the Raspberry Pi is offset so that the, um, the header on the top on my board is, is kind of central in the robot. Um, the actual robot has literally been built just today or finished being built today. So I've recorded an inaugural video um, to showcase it on the jam. So this is the actual robot being driven by me whilst filming. So I'm steering it with one hand. And as you can see, it's, it's still got all of the fun and tumble. Um, it's extremely nippy. This is kind of not driving it at full speed because it just kind of shoots across the room and uh, rolls over kind of like 10 or more times. But it's, it's just immense fun to, to drive. And it's using um, overpowered, uh, the overvolted motors because my board enables me to regulate the current going to the motor so I don't burn out the motors when they stall. So that was the design. Um, you can see all of the parts in an exploded view here. And I find that these design tools really help me to kind of refine and, and design out all the kind of little wrinkles. So now I've got a robot that's much more robust. It should hopefully kind of take the knocks and be able to be driven by people at Raspberry Jams uh, when we're allowed to meet up in person without getting damaged. So then I think kind of all, kind of what improvements are there still to be made? And uh, for one, I think the batteries at the moment, you can't charge them in situ um, unless you charge them through the cable. So I'd like to maybe make the back half of this cover removable so that you can pop the batteries out to put them in a charger. That would be quite nice. Um, I'd also, I think I'm gonna design some rubberized bumpers for the front and back. So that when this thing smashes into the furniture, it doesn't leave dents in the furniture. Um, so I'm gonna print something out of the, one of the flexible filaments that will clip on over the pillars um, and act as just a bit of a, a buffer at the front and back. And, and it's really just made me think about kind of what can I do to design a more robust robot rather than just kind of throwing everything together and having something I can drive around quickly. How can I build something that will really stand the, the take the knocks and, and stand the test of time? So that's the end of the screen share. I will just show you the actual real thing. I can show you on camera here. You can see that um, that looks a thing of beauty. <laughs> I've 3D printed the plates because I can't get to the laser cutter, but the intention was that they would be laser cut with all the holes in. Um, but because I was 3D printing it, I actually decided, and if you can see that top plate's actually got curved kind of panel on the underside, yep. which um, helps to, to kind of hold the batteries in place. Although there's a bit of a clearance gap because I um, realized after I'd done the CAD that I could actually fit the battery holder a bit lower. So I can, move that down a bit so the batteries are really held firmly in place and, and won't come out when it's being kind of smashed around the room. Paul, may I ask a couple of questions? Yes. Coming up? So one of the things I wanted to ask was, we there was a lot of praise before when Brian was sharing his source code via GitHub. I noticed you use some software drawings and I 
didn't hear. Did you say you're able to share those drawings with other people or you've decided, no, you, you, you... Um, it's not something I've considered yet yeah. um, because this was really built as a test bed for the electronics hardware which I've designed, um, which I'm intending to kind of try and productize. Um, uh, I wonder but... if Brian had his microphone on now, Brian might say something like, oh, but Paul, maybe it's something that you might want to consider because as I'm sure you know, extolling the virtues of uh, sharing source code freely. It may be that somebody might take some of those drawings that you've done and rather commercialize it. They might make some tweaks and improvements and then you can end up you know, with a, a collaborative uh, solution. But if that's not the direction you're heading in, then obviously I, I don't want to steer you. Yeah, off. no, I mean, yeah. it's a really good kind of topic. Um, I do, a, a lot of these parts um, for a start to actually model all of this in CAD took a lot of work. Sure. Um, now, the wheels in the CAD model you saw actually came from Mark Mellers, who designed a robot using these. These are wheels that Pimeroni sell and they're quite common Raspberry Pi part. And he designed a robot using them in CAD. And so he shared his wheel files on a site called GrabCAD. And I tend to upload parts that I design that are components on GrabCAD for the same reason. So if somebody wants to, to kind of do some CAD modeling or to 3D print one of my parts, then those, those bits are all kind of shared there. I haven't yet decided if I'm going to share the whole robot because uh, just because it's too early. I, I, I finished the CAD design you know, yesterday and, and I haven't really thought much more about it. It, uh, I wonder whether we should, one of our themes should be in the future was the merits of sharing. Because I know, for example, Josh, I've not heard much from Josh tonight, but I know that Josh was uh, sharing something earlier in the week about how he didn't think it was fair that he had shared something, but then somebody was taken out and it looks like not in the terms in which he'd shared it. They were looking to derive some kind of commercial return yeah and that, that and that is the big danger yeah, yeah. um I, I know for example if you want to go and buy one of the um breakout boards that adafruit make then a lot of them you can buy from china for a fraction of the cost yeah. because adafruit open source their designs and so there's nothing to stop somebody taking that and making a kind of slightly yeah. dishonest uh, buck by as, selling as the design yeah. made on the cheap as has happened with Arduino and, and these other things. Yeah. I'll save the other question for the jam jar session later because I'm mindful that we we have one talk yes, left sure. this evening. But it it's certainly it's a good discussion to have about whether we should share things more freely or whether we should do what some map makers used to do, where they would deliberately sometimes hide mistakes Easter eggs in there. In the map. Yeah. yeah. Well, an Easter egg's like a treat. This is like the opposite of an Easter yeah, egg. Yeah, they still call them Easter eggs. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, you the might intentionally, do it. Yeah, 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 you might intentionally put a, a wobbly spoke in your wheel. And when, when you start seeing them for sale on AliExpress, you can go, I know where they got that wobbly spoke design from. Um, okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you for offering to speak. Uh, and the same applies to everybody else. Thank you, everybody. We've got one more presentation that we've been building up to this evening, and it's Mike Horn, one of the founding members of a, a, a number of things. There's, a, there's the Pot and Pie and Pints, and I can see Michael's video over there and waving at Michael. And Michael, you should be able to screen share if you are choosing to do that. I think he's probably doing it right now. Yeah. Do you know what? Shut up, Alan. Over to you, Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, as Alan said, my name is Mike Horn, and I'm one of the organisers of Pi Wars, the robotics competition powered by the Raspberry Pi. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about our experience with the events we run, primarily so you can see the kind of robots that people build. Um, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but hopefully you'll enjoy seeing all the robots. So I wanted to start with two questions. Why do makers make? And where does their inspiration come from? Now, why do makers make? Now, I asked this question on Twitter to find out what people would say. Um, one of the most popular ones was for mental health reasons, just to give their creative energy some focus. Um, people said that because they've got an innate curiosity as to how things work. Um, for the sheer joy of creation, for a sense of achievement and the joy of learning new skills. That's one I always go for. 
in the hope of passing knowledge on to others, especially kids, which I think a lot of um, Raspberry Jam organizers can certainly appreciate. To make things for people to appreciate, just to show, show them off. And as a stepping off point for meeting like-minded individuals at jams and at other events like EMF camp. So in terms of inspiration, most people said that they just see something that they consider to be really cool um, in nature sometimes, on television, on social media. One of the things that really came across was that people like to stand on the shoulders of giants. They like to improve and they like to expand apart, uh, along the lines of what they've seen already. So everyone must have a reason and an inspiration for making. I couldn't find a single person who makes just to make. They've always got to have a reason. So it's why we started Pi Wars. We wanted to give people a reason to make, give them a goal to aim at and give them inspiration to start on a journey and to see what, where that journey would take them. Oh, my slide will not move on. There we go. So I want to share you with some of the notable robots and roboteers we've had compete over the 70s of Pi Wars. Last time I spoke to you um, a few months ago, I think it was May 2020, I think it was, um, gave you some ideas on how to get started with physical computing and that sort of thing. So we'll have, this time we'll see what people have built, what's possible, and give you ideas for what you can build. Um, one thing to note is that all these robots that you'll see Teams have to uh, have to only submit one robot, which has to be remote controlled and autonomous. So it has to do dual function. For our first Pi Wars back in 2014, we allowed much larger robots and categorized them according to how much they cost. Here you can see a robot made out of a pirate ship toy by Leo White, facing off in the sumo challenge against Brian Cortiel's Pyrobot, which was the smallest robot in the competition. Just this photo alone made us reconsider the size restrictions of the event, and indeed whether to run the sumo event the following year, which we didn't. Both roboteers still compete in Pi Wars and they're now in the advanced slash pro category. You can see some more of the robots from 2014 in this short video. In 2015, we relocated the competition to the Cambridge Computer Lab. We upgraded the courses and found that those who had competed before had improved their robot build building skills. We also found that people who had come to see the event in 2014 had taken ideas from the comp competitors and entered Pi Wars themselves. Brian Cortiel returned with a robot called Revenge of Pi Robot. If you can see the red bit on top, that's his robot from 2014 perched on top of this amazing fast six-wheel drive robot. Tom Oyne joined us for 2015 and created our first omni-wheeled robot, Triangular. It was an absolute demon in Pi Noon, our new robot versus robot challenge. David Pride joined us with his robot, Shazbot. It looked amazing, handled well, but came a cropper on our line follower course. This certainly taught us, the organisers, a lesson about not having too much colour on a line following course. It literally couldn't see the difference between the black, the green and everything else. We always have surprises at Pi Wars. In 2015, we introduced the Skittles challenge. Simply roll a ball into the set of Skittles and knock them over. A simple challenge, we thought. We expected people to just ram their robots into the ball and hope for the best. Hitchin Hackspace had other ideas. If you listen very closely, you can hear the death hum. It's a set of flywheels going, counter, going in opposition to each other and then touching the ball. Often we let challenge courses run for more than one year so we can see how roboteers improve. The three point turn was an autonomous challenge. The idea was to drive to the black line, 
then make a series of turns before ending up back where you started. This is Metabot on their challenge winning on their challenge winning run. Absolutely perfect. We skipped a year and rescheduled the event for March of 2017 to allow more schools to compete and to run over two days. The designs became more elaborate as the roboteers fed off each other's ideas and we added an artistic merit challenge which helped the teams to focus on the look of their robots, not just how they worked. One of our favourites from this year was Ely Makers who put a cardboard model of Ely Cathedral on top of their chassis. Returning team Ipswich Makerspace impressed us with their robot. It featured, in a recurring theme, googly eyes. Their line following ability scored them high marks that year. There were even more elaborate designs than the Ely Makers robot. This one featured a fluffy brain beneath a perspex dome, which really caught our eye. As did this one, called Zero Chatterbot, based on a Fisher Price toy phone which used Omni Wheels. David Pride returned after his first year with Shazbot with a new robot called Cyberchondriac. Anyway, it had its successes and its failures. Here's a particularly impressive run on the straight line speed test course. By now we had several international competitors that came from all over the world, including the USA and also Switzerland. This was their robot, Gianopi. 2018 was the year a lilac teapot stole our hearts. As you can see here, it used a tea strainer to guide a ball around the golf course, which was called the slightly deranged golf course. It was also the year that a maker called Mark Mellers attempted all the challenges autonomously with his robot paradigm. To mixed results, but it was a valiant effort and it, imp it, and it impressed us so much that people, we suddenly realized that people could do a lot more with autonomous robots. Also featured that year was a team from Raspberry Pi laptop maker PyTop. Their robot was a PyTop on wheels, proving you can make a robot out of anything. Hitchin Hackspace returned. Their new robot, Tito, had a 3D printed articulated chassis. See the way it twists at the front. Tito featured in the Sunday Pie Noon final with driver David Booth facing off against a returning David Pride who had finally solved all his glitches from the previous year. It lasted a lot longer than that, by the way, I just edited it down. In 2019, we decided to make Pi Wars themed around space exploration to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing. As usual, our, around half the courses were new and we had lots of space themed robots. One of our favorites was this Lost in Space themed rover designed by Sumit Matra. He's competing in the 2021 competition with a robot which is named Smokey in tribute to the remains of this robot. Even our young teams got in on the space buggy design action. This is the winner of the experienced young teams category called Bobby Tables. Bobby Tables was absolutely relentless. It had these really grippy wheels and a great balance between motor torque and speed. It was one of the few robots to eat up the treadmill part of the obstacle course, which you'll see in a second. Just powered its way through. Oh, come on. Also in our favourites list of the year were two rocker bogey suspension robots called the Featherstone Rover, which is on the left, and Ro Rocky Rover on the right, which is by Dr Footleg. Here you can see them surrounding John Chinner's Raspberry Pi powered Mars Rover, Yuri 3, which was there for the show and tell. Among the space themed robots was Sputnik. Made by Colin Grant and his family, you can here see the robot do a terrific challenge winning run on the Canyons of Maze, Mars Maze course. And of course, the wackiness continued. We had our first ever self-balancer from Brian Cortiel called Faceplant. It was an amazing build which performed, well, it wasn't called Faceplant for nothing and it needed the padding at the top a lot. But Brian wanted to challenge himself to do something completely different that year. He gave himself a reason to make things harder for himself. We thought we'd seen a robot as small as it was possible to go with the first year's Pyrobot, but we were wrong. 
Roboteer Brian Starkey created Minnie Mouse and it did rather well. And that's a real photograph, by the way, especially on the Hubble telescope challenge. The idea here was to autonomously visit each corner of the box in the correct order, according to the colored cards, which were semi randomly placed at the start of each robot's run. What you didn't see there was Minnie Mouse turning on the spot at the start, scanning the colors and programming itself with the correct path to take. Returning to the start point at the end was completely unnecessary, but very cool. Another favorite that year was Brian's son, Bill, which, who built himself a robot which always carried Babbage in a spacesuit on its back. After 2019's competition, we were on a roll or so we thought, um, but then COVID-19 hit and we had to cancel 2020, which was, irony of ironies, disaster themed. So we didn't let the robot building go to waste and we ran a virtual Pi Wars with a show and tell online. You can find them all on piewars.org, but here's just a few of the robots that submitted. This is Amy, who's been involved with Pi Wars since the very beginning. She works with her dad, Phil, and the Ipswich Makerspace team to build these incredibly detailed robots. This year's one is called Audrey 3, which is a tribute to Little Shop of Horrors. And here she's showing off the zombie killing ball rolling mechanism. And when we started Pi Wars, we didn't really imagine a lot of the robots that appeared. Dangle is a prime example. It balances on two wheels with a low center of gravity and a counterbalancing small third caster. You can see in this short video how well it performs. Beautiful piece of engineering. Once again, we had some incredibly innovative robots. Keegan Neve created McFeagle Prime, which was inspired by Johnny Five from the movie Short Circuit. He's now working full time as a robot builder and is articulating the arms at the moment. Josh Patman set himself the task of building a small version of the Boston Dynamics Spot robot. And I think his robot Spot Puppy is actually cuter than the real thing. Mark Mellors returned with a new fully autonomous robot called Taradyme. He created this fantastic contraption for loading and unloading barrels, which hopefully we'll see next year. And we all really laughed at Martin's video of his robot based around a Reliant Robin. Reliant Rat Radio, the enemy autonomous vehicle for all disaster scenarios. Features, three wheels, that's a 25% savings. Reliant Rat Radio, the enemy autonomous vehicle for all disaster scenarios. We also love that returning team Pydrogen stepped things up a gear with their latest incarnation. Such a beautiful, beefy robot, this one. And it does open CV so well. This year, all our competitors are building their own arenas with their own courses at home. A few of them were kind enough to send some photographs and videos of their robots in progress. This is Chameleon which is from the team that created Dangle, taking on the autonomous with voice hints course up the garden path. Stop. Team Pydrogen has returned with a new robot based on previous ideas. This is an autonomous run of the color block sorting challenge, tidy up the toys. It's sped up by five times because it's so complicated that um, it was very, it's quite slow at the moment. Young Angus has built his robot out of an enormous red Lego brick. As you can see from this garden path run, assisted by shouting at the robot, it's beautifully programmed. And I hope that's given you an insight into the robots that we see at Pi Wars and what you can build if you put your mind and your skills to it. Because robotics is fun, it's challenging, it's certainly challenging having built one myself, and it's rewarding. And there's loads of tutorials out there ranging from just getting your motors going to designing a chassis to 3D printing it and to design your own circuit boards. Uh, we had a conference this year which has produced a good dozen or so videos to watch. And you can make a career out of developing your skills. We've had people doing Pi Wars who've got on to study robotics at university, and then they can progress and contribute to things like car manufacturing and robot arms and exploring other planets. The sky is no longer the limit. So if you haven't got a current maker project in mind, consider building a robot and consider entering Pi Wars. It's great fun, but it will take over your life.
Michael, um, here's a clap on behalf of our YouTube audience. Absolutely fantastic. We, I'm so delighted for you to come along and share because it's not just your project. It, there's, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people have been involved in all of this. I've got a couple of questions and then I'm going to share details about how we're going to go into Jamdiar. Um, first question, I'm sure you've seen over the last few years, how we've got all of these programs on TV. We've got the Great British Bake Off. We've got the Pottery Throwdown, the Sewing Bee. And I've heard people go, we need to have something like this for computing. And I'm like, we do have, we have, it already exists. You, what you need to do is get a team together and get them there. My question is, when you and some of the others you work with, like Tim, right back in the beginning, did you have any idea it would grow to what it is now? No. <laughs> no, the first year we had, I think it was 28 teams who entered and I think 22 made it to the competition. We thought that's going to be the limit. I always put low expectations on everything. I'm known for it. Um, but we thought, you know, 22, that's about the limit for the size of venue that we had. And then we, then we, the following year, we had about 80 people and it thought, oh, okay, that's got a bit out of hand. <laughs> what, what I find particularly lovely when I've been there myself is some people have already figured out I'm quite chatty and yucky and I go around and, oh, Michael, it's so nice to see you, oh, you, you know, but actually that's, that would, when I've been to Pie Wars, it, it's very quiet and there's a lot of people there. So I'm thinking like Exa has submitted uh, team robots in the past. And some of the young people within that team at Exa, they're not like me. They're, they're very quiet. They're very, and they just get on with things. And right now, as you and I are chatting about this, we know that there is at least 100 people around the UK right now, not watching this, because they know exactly what it is. Just like, you know, when we saw the Perseverance rover land on Mars last week and, you know, we saw maybe a hundred people on the screen going like, yeah, high five it. But there are thousands of people behind them that make all of this happen and they don't often get the limelight. So I think it is just truly fantastic that with events like Pi Wars that you're able to give people who don't necessarily want to be on stage, on a microphone, but give them a way that they can develop their talent. That is absolutely brilliant. Uh, final question. Um, yep. So COVID is making all of us think differently about what we do and, you know, particularly travel. I mean, I love to go to Cambridge, but it, for us, it's like a 10 hour return journey or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Has, you know, let's imagine a future beyond COVID july 21 or, or or beyond do you think that certain things now might have changed your thinking to the pie wars might it or do you think it'll just go back to pretty much the format that it was before i think for 2022 all things being equal we want to try and do the disaster zone which we had planned because we've got the courses built and lots of people contributed to building them and we had different people built different courses because Tim said that we can do it but I don't want to build all the courses this time um, so we had several different building teams but who knows after that because Pi Wars at Home has shown us that we can do challenge courses in a quite compact way because I think the arena this year is 1.5 meter square and everything is in it except the obstacle course which mm -hmm. is um, free it's free you can do what you like um, but I think it's it sort of highlighted to us that, yeah, the big courses are fantastic, but we could do a portable version. And certainly um, Brian's had great success doing micro pie noon and taking it to things like Derby Maker Fair. Um, so there's so there's all these possibilities of making it portable and taking it on the road. I think, I mean, definitely, it, it, I suppose, like other things like going to Disneyland or Silicon Valley or a day trip to London. It, it really is such a wonderful experience when you can go there and you, and as Nick has just said on YouTube, he says, you can have great fun supporting, you know, workshops, but you can also go and see what other teams have done. And it's one of those competitions as well, where you don't necessarily show your code to people. People don't get to go, oh, Brian, that is so elegantly written. Cause it's very much about the, like your robots in the, 
zone with another one or, or on its own. And it's just how it performs on the day. And there's been some amazing, really well engineered ones that have a battery failure or, or a wire comes out at the very last moment. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... I remember when Dave Pride did Cyber Contract the first year he bought it, he had... I mean, his robot had a meltdown on the day. It just, it, there was this maze course and it just would not do it. <laughs> and he came back the following year and he said, this robot works this time and he won everything. Um, <laughs> so um, you get you get people turn up and they have a burnout or a bit falls off or and they have just complete nightmare on the day. The the thing that I'm, I'm sure you're aware of as well, the Pi Wars over, is it? five or six years now it's been running or so am i right i think this this would have been our disaster zone would have been the sixth yeah um it, yeah. you just look back at the legacy i mean you you just go somewhere and you search use that tag or whatever pie wars and there's so many videos and photographs and like, as you said before all those people that's kind of helped guide and put people together on, on a yeah. common project so Thank you so much. Now, for our audience watching on YouTube, I'm now going to explain how our jam jar will work. Now, some people have already been there and they're well seasoned and they know and they don't need to listen to me and they can just head over there. Now, there is something I would like to do just beforehand, which is something that we've been working on as part of our, our jam organizers. I just want to share something on the screen. This will just take a brief moment and uh, I could share some sound as well. So I'm doing a screen share now myself. I just want to show you that if you were to visit after this evening, if you use the same link that you use to join, which is exit.is forward slash rjam live, that will normally take you to this playlist, which is uh, on YouTube. You can also get there by going to exit.is forward slash channel. So let's just say you have the link, you know how to get there. At the moment, we just have two recordings from previous jams. So we've got one from April and we've got one from February. Oh, did, 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 it was like nearly a year ago. And if you go to the playlist and click on there, what I want to show you is I'm That's sure good. you have done this before with YouTube videos. But just in case you don't, we'd love to hear some feedback. If you go to the description this has taken a bit of time to do this, and this is why I wanted to show it to you. We have timestamps now for each of the individual talks. So say, for example, um, oh, Alan was saying something about Gary's robot. You could just go there, click on that. And so I thought um, this morning I talked to you about my... It goes straight to Gary's talk. Say, oh, brilliant. And oh, steady hand game. I don't remember that one. And you click on the time and it takes you... I'm Nadi from South and Raspberry okay. Jam. And I... So that's something it takes about two or three hours or so to put one of those recordings together in that way. We do also have last month's. OK, I make it seven. And this time you can see um, it, 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 it said there at 8.15, Stephen Amor was going to do his uh, talk. And I, I did apologize for that early on, uh, Stephen, I don't know if you're watching. But Gary mentioned the blob. You can click on there. We had John Chinner. Uh, we had Scott Young was talking about space on. data. This is more to make people so why are we doing this? We're trying to do this to make all of the talks that we've had accessible and available to you. So it would really, really help if you found a way to get in contact and say, yeah, but maybe do this or try that or could you or whatever, or you could just fill in the feedback form that I mentioned. So um, over the next year or so, you should start to see, I thought maybe if we did one a month, because three or four hours to do that every every day is, is quite a long thing. Now, the jam jar. So I said the jam jar would start about 8.45. Here we are. So the jam jar, um, when we do our physical jams, basically, we used to go to the building next door, which was open until later at night. And they sold things like sparkling water and Vimto and all those other things and crisps. Crisps with Lancashire sauce. Mmm, I miss those. However, what we now do as part of our online jam is from this time on to about 9.30 or, or thereabouts till, till people have to go to bed, we host breakout rooms. And they're small informal online rooms where you're encouraged to maybe turn on your camera and your microphone and, and you know join in or just listen to the chat that's going on. 
and it, it could mean as well, so we, we'll, we'll probably set up, depending on how many people join us, we might have two or three breakout rooms and you can go and move around and mingle. You just, when you're in Zoom, because you're going to come and join our just Zoom session in a moment, you just need to click on the breakout tab and you can go to the main room where I will be and I will welcome you when you arrive. And um, we have some fun there. So this link here, if you uh, um, have access to a computer that has Zoom software installed, if you now use that link, exa.is forward slash jam jar, I will copy and paste it into our YouTube chat as well. And I will wait for you now in Zoom. So I am going to stop our recording, which is on Zoom at the moment. And I will stop the live stream in a few minutes. So I stopped the share. I need to go now over to the live stream, post the link to the jam jar into the chat for people who are on YouTube. And now in Zoom, what usually happens is people, it starts saying, admit these people, admit these people. So, um, and then once we've got a few people, I will set up some rooms. Now, what I'm gonna do, I don't know if, if people can hear me. We have a breakout room, one room at the moment, which I am now going to go and close that room. And I will create three rooms. So Nadine is here. So everybody just turn your cameras on if you want now, microphones. And in a moment, we will stop the live stream on Twitter. Once people can see, we've got a few bit of a crowd in here. Eclipse channel and then monetize. Uh, we will stop. Nick, I think you're confusing us with somebody else. Okay, breakout rooms. So we're going to close any existing rooms. And then I think, depending on numbers. So we've got Martin, Josh Stewart, Eddie, they're all coming in. Now, here's the thing. If you need a break, you, you know, you need a comfort break, you need to go off and get some of those crisps with the Lancashire sauce, just stay in Zoom because then you won't have to be readmitted. <laughs> um, Co-hosts can admit as well if you want to save a little bit of the, the load. So we've got people coming in and joining us now. We've got Kevin and Brian. Um, so I will. I haven't set up the breakout rooms just yet. I will do that in a few moments. We've got 13 people here at the moment. What did I just say? I thought that was an important thing. I might need to repeat this again. Oh, yes. Once you're in Zoom, stay in Zoom if you think you're going to be in later on. And if you need to set up the breakout rooms, go on go. a comfort break or something like that, then just mute your camera, mute your audio, and then you can only tap back, back in later. people here at the moment. Now, uh, YouTube, I'm going to say goodbye to people on YouTube. Because what we're going to do now is I'm going to stop the YouTube live stream and then I can edit the recording and share that later on. So good night, YouTubers. <laughs> Been lovely.